Let's get stuck in. So James has put the link of the Ramchal, chapter 22, this holy book, Path for Just, which we've nearly just finished. So my gosh, we have to really enjoy the last few moments. Instagram, don't go anywhere. We're gonna, it's going to get good. Oh, this was the preamble. Let's go straight in. Says the Ramchal. What is humility? What is humility? And he says like this. Which before I translate, maybe message in. If I was asked you define humility, what is the definition of humility? Or actually, what is the, yeah, what the means to achieving humility? On Instagram, Facebook, Zoom, please put in your definition now. Let's see if we can get some cool definitions. What is humility? So Cyril's saying respect. Who else? Come on. Let's, let's hear lots of definitions of humility. We're going for compassion. We're going for kindness. What else? Humility, well, not needing credit. Good. But we can do better. Come on. Define humility, anyone? Not to show off. Okay. That's, what else? Anyone? Instagram, I'm not seeing you. Facebook, I'm not seeing you. And any definitions of humility? We're going Keith's self-effacement. I like that. Good. Modesty. Anyone else? Definition of humility. Let's hear Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato's definition of humility. Are you ready for this? Here we go. That a person should regard himself as unimportant in all situations. Let's define that again. It's every word is important. Kalal ha'anobahi is odam bilti machshiv atzmimishum. You're never important. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, it's not about you. You know, a lot of people think it's all about me. It's only about me. You know, there was a true story. There was literally this billionaire who went and rented an island, as you do, for his son's bar mitzvah a few years ago. True story, right? And they got the bar mitzvah, everyone comes and, and having this whole bar mitzvah celebration. And the billionaire was really just kind of giving a fantastic marketing campaign for him and his business. And, and at a certain point, they said, I thought we're here for your like son's bar mitzvah. He goes, no, 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 it's all about me. He actually said it. And she said, it's all about me. And at least he was honest. And I think a lot of people out there have the misconception and the tragic evil inclinations misperception that it's all about me. How many of you sometimes have been in relationships where it's been all about the other person? Or maybe if we're being honest with each other, how many times maybe have you been in conversations or in life situations and it's been all about you? Maybe even right now as I'm speaking, maybe it's triggering things about you. And then you'll say, because, but it's really, I'm not, to be fair, I am speaking to you, but it's not about you. In other words, you know, I'm talking just truth of what the Ramchal is saying and how many times people get upset when they're having certain experiences and conversations and they think it's about them, but it was never about them. So one little lesson for you, it's not always about you. And probably it's hardly ever about you, number one. Number two, here's the key point. A person should regard himself as unimportant in all circumstances. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Unimportant in, in no circumstances. That means even when you're doing something of importance. So let's say, Verda, when you're doing a project to work and you put a lot of work into that project and you've excelled and it's gone well, don't afterwards think, Shh, I'm so important. I'm the most important person in this company. You know, when Svi, you do a deal at work and you do some great property stuff and you make someone happy. And afterwards, you think, you know, I'm really, really important to this project. I've got news for you. Everyone's replaceable. Everybody, you know, and, and it's all Hashem. It's actually all Hashem. It's not about us at all. We are, if we're blessed, we're blessed to be a vehicle and a conduit in Hashem's world, in Hashem's blessing, in, in the project Moshe Rabbeinu who you would have thought was the greatest of all time, was the greatest agent, took us out of Egypt. Yet we say on Passover, Nagada, Hashem took us out, 
not through an agent. Meaning we totally diss Moses on the biggest night of Passover, the, the book, the prince of Egypt. We don't even speak about the prince because it wasn't about him. It was about Hashem freeing his nation to allow us to be of service to him. And when you're a servant, it's not about you. The moment you think it's about you, you can no longer be a servant. So step one is really in your places of expertise. And we've all been blessed with different talents, with different areas of expertise. Let's not make the mistake. Let's not make the mistake of thinking you are important and vital and essential to the project. You are what Hashem is using at that moment. Whether you're going to be what Hashem is going to be using in 10 minutes or 10 minutes or 10 hours or 10 weeks or 10 months. You know, Boris Johnson right now is fighting for his life to stay in 10 Downing Street. And he probably thinks he's the most important person in the UK. I've got news for him. The moment Hashem decides that he wants Rishi Sunak or he wants someone else to be prime minister, bang, they'll be prime minister. And our job, therefore, is when we are given modes of responsibility and talents and opportunities to make a big difference in the world. At that point, more than any point, we should feel so humble. And, and we're saying the definition of humble is when at that moment, when you're doing good, you realize it's not you. And you realize you're not attaching importance to you at all in any way, shape, way or form. So that's the first point. Never to attach importance to yourself in all circumstances. And then he writes, this is the opposite of gava, of haughtiness, one of the biggest spiritual crimes in history. It says in the Talmud, Hashem says, you can do most sins and I'll understand it and I'll still be with you. But the Talmud says, Hashem says, when you're egotistical, when you're arrogant, there's no space for me. We, there's no space. You know, your ego in your head is too big. I can't get in. I can't get in. And therefore, humility is the antithesis of haughtiness, of arrogance. Nice to see you, Dino, on Instagram. Stay with us. So what we're going to learn tonight is not only to be humble, but not to be arrogant. So we're essentially going to be achieving two things at the same time, two sides of the same coin. And he writes, then the results that emerge from this will be just the opposite of those that emerge from haughtiness. So when is someone is haughty, one is disconnecting from God. When one, is someone, when one is humble, you are uniting with Hashem. You are elevating. You are growing. And then he writes like this. We will now define the components. Humility of thought. He always, the Ramchal, likes to make a distinction between thought and action. He says the following. First of all, what is thought? Humility of thought means that a person should contemplate and realize that he is unworthy of praise and honor. So I don't know if any of you in the past week, month, year have said, I didn't get praised. I wasn't respected. I wasn't honored. No one gave me a thank you. No one showed appreciation. I've got news for you. That's normally coming from your Yitzhahara. That's normally coming from your lower self. Your soul doesn't even want it. Your soul would love to be anonymous. Some of the greatest Sadiqim was so anonymous. They hated public adulation and credit. They just wanted to almost disappear and just be anonymous. And that's really something we should be striving for. We're all spiritual beings who are trying to journey in the arena of spirituality. You really want to grow spiritually? A prerequisite is humility, my friends. Humility. We need to be humble. And therefore, you shouldn't be like expecting the pat on the back. Now, I think we need to like deal with the elephant in the room. Anyone know what the elephant in the room is? What do you think the elephant in the room is? Any ideas which elephants I'm referring to? Maybe there's a few elephants going on in the room or in the Zoom. The elephant in the Zoom. Any ideas what the elephant in the Zoom is? So the elephant in the Zoom, I believe, is one minute. We're living in a culture where it is important, let's say if you're a manager or a boss, to show appreciation to the staff to show respect, to, to do congratulate. And, and actually, if you, any of you are a manager or a boss, I would be saying to you, it's really important to show a lot of appreciation to your staff. So how do we balance out between on one hand, it's the right thing to show appreciation, but it's the wrong thing to crave appreciation and to need appreciation. So I'd like to share with you the following point. 
My friends, humility is not synonymous to low self-esteem. A lot of people make this tragic mistake. They say, oh, I'm so humble. I'm nothing. You know, I, I'm nothing to no one. That's not necessarily harm humility. That could be you need a really good therapist to help boost your self-esteem. Hashem wants you to have good self-esteem. It says, you should love your friend the way you love yourself. Step one, before you can love someone else, is to love yourself. Self-love is pivotal and paramount importance in your spiritual journey. And this is the way to do it. You should feel a sense of incredible love for yourself, the way you have love for your children. And, and incredible fortune that Hashem has blessed you to be taking on one of the tasks that he has for you in this world. You should feel a sense of huge appreciation and gratitude and having good self-esteem. And therefore, when you have good self-esteem, you actually then actually ironically don't need the level of appreciation that people do when they have low self-esteem. A lot of people who have low self-esteem get very upset and very troubled when they're not thanked, when they're not appreciated. If you're at work and it was your idea and then someone else gets the credit, it can drive someone crazy. It can drive you insane. It can lead to people quitting work. It can lead to people ending relationships. But the irony is often a lot of it comes not from the mistakes of your colleagues and your employers. Often it comes, unfortunately, from that low self-esteem. I see you, Larry, and, and Instagram. And therefore, what the Ramchal is saying is when you're healthy in a healthy place where you filled your vessel with your love, you don't need anyone else filling it as well. You don't need that pat on the back because you've given yourself the healthy pat on the back. It's like my children. If I give them enough love and really fill them with love, they don't need some other dad coming to say, you know, you're amazing. Because they feel, hopefully, genuinely amazing. They don't need someone else coming to, like, join the party because they are full of love. And therefore, if you have that healthy self-esteem, it's much easier to be in a place where you don't need appreciation from anyone. You actually don't like the appreciation. You don't need the recognition. It's that as long as God's work gets done. So, for example, let's say, let's say one of you were blessed enough to be the the one that finds the cure for cancer. Please God, I bless you, one of you should achieve that in your scientific research and success. Now in the secular world, you'd want to like patent it. You'd want to, you know, make sure that your name is up in lights, your name may be connected to the name of, of the discovery of, of, of the treatment. The Hill treatment, you're gonna want your name literally up in lights. But that's coming from ego. If you think about it, let's say one of you is so blessed to be the one that Hashem uses to help you find the cure for cancer. Who cares who gets the recognition? As long as people get cured, people, you know, are happy and healthy. They don't have to suffer the way people have been suffering. That's what we should care about. We shouldn't care about your ego getting massaged and getting your head getting a bit bigger. So the Ramchal is saying, even if you come up with incredible feats, incredible accomplishments once you bring god into the picture we understand that we're here to be of service it's not about you it's not about you as i said no one gave did a greater accomplishment than taking the jewish people out of egypt and he deleted his name from the book he said hashem delete me i want it to be deleted from the book so it's something for us to think about my friends to start really processing where, when are you, and I want you to think about this right now, when are you asking for credit, for appreciation, and when is that coming actually from an unhealthy place, from an ego place, from what we call the Yitzhahara's place? And actually, by not asking for it, by saying to Hashem, actually, I don't need any credit, I don't need any, you know, Rabbi Tatz always, when we did live talks with him for years and years, people's, at the beginning of his lecture, like years back, at the end of his lecture, people used to clap at the end. He used to hate it. The way he used to put it, Jewish people don't clap, right? But I think he was coming from a place. He didn't want appreciation or congratulations. He did his job from Hashem to share some Torah, and then he's off. Don't start. It's not about him. That's why he's got no airs and graces. He doesn't like to say, I'm rabbi. He says, oh, I'm a kiva. He just, he, they, he couldn't be more humble. He's one of the greatest men on the planet. 
but yet he's so genuinely humble because he understands that he's just been blessed that Hashem's giving him the opportunity to share. And that's it. And therefore, it's not about him. He doesn't need congratulations. He doesn't need appreciation. He does his job. And then he does it again an hour later somewhere else. And then an hour later somewhere else. An hour later somewhere else. And that's one of the reasons Hashem trusts him because he's not going to take any credit away from Hashem. You see? He's not taking any of the glory from the king. That's who Hashem works through, my friends. If you want to take the glory, Hashem says, okay, you're not for me. You, you, can, you can serve the lower world. And, and, and there's other forces that, that are happy for, to delight in having credit. But that's not for spiritualists. People who are trying to really connect spiritually, it's not about getting credit. So let's continue. Says the Ramchal the following. Humility of thought means a person should contemplate and realize he is unworthy of praise and honor, let alone any superiority above others due to his natural faults and due to the limitations of what he has already accomplished. So one of the ways to do it, and you could try this, try this for those of you who perhaps understand that your head's a bit bigger than it should be and needs a little bit coming down to reality. Rivka, what's up? Nice to see you on Instagram. Here's the go. It is a bit of a weird thing to do, but I recommend it. Next time you think your Yitzhar is, oh, I should be deserving some credit. Do they not know who I am? Say back to yourself, um, do you know what I get up to sometimes, like when no one's around? You know, maybe I'm not all that. You know, do they know what's really going on in some of my inner thoughts? Do they know some of my, like, you know, deepest, darkest secrets, which the last thing I'd want anyone to hear and to know, which, by the way, ironically, everyone will hear and know unless we do to shiver, because at the end of our lives, we have this big life review where then everything's out there. So, by the way, there is no hiding place. So, if you start actually sometimes just to get yourself down, a bit more grounded and, and it's not it's not a, it's it's a really it's a very i do this i do this i like you know oh my gosh i deserve credit i deserve some respect do they do they even know like some of the the mistakes and some of my you know human weaknesses so that can be a way to ground you that can be a way to ground you sometimes just saying it's all coming from hashem that's enough sometimes you need to be very shine a mirror in your face and you realize you're not as beautiful as you thought you were and that could just be a way to ground you and again for anyone who's listening to this who's got low self-esteem beware there should be a big caution because if you've got low self-esteem perhaps your job isn't actually to do work to really bring yourself down so you're probably doing a great job of that already so ironically then you've got to go to the opposite extreme which first and foremost is you've got to fill yourself up with self-esteem we're going to learn about how to do soon and then when you're really in a healthy place of self-esteem then you can be humble but it can't be the other way around ironically you've got low self-esteem just like you can't love someone else because we have to love them over you can only love someone to you love yourself you actually ironically can't be humble genuinely if you hate yourself if you're really harsh with yourself because humility is coming from a place of good from a healthy place not from an unhealthy place and then he says like following he says like this, in terms of his own faults, it's obvious that it's impossible for any person to be without faults. Do you know, like, everybody sins. Moses, Moses sins. We all sin. Hashem's given us the Yitzhara. We sin. So let's not think we're like, there's no such thing as perfection. We're not perfect. These may derive from his own nature, sometimes from family, relatives, from certain things that has happened to him. So it says in, in Kohelet, chapter 7, verse 20, there is no righteous person in the whole land who will always do good and not sin. By the way, the Talmud says maybe there's four. Benjamin was one of them. King David's father and son were another, another two. There's four individuals who seemingly never sin, but everyone else sins. We all sin. And therefore, let's not say I'm perfect. You know, people say, oh, I'm the best. I'm perfect. I'm amazing. Chill out. Relax, everyone. You're not as perfect as you think you are. In other words, we need to do, we need to ground us and bring us to a place of modesty and humility. Even if you have many virtues, we've all got faults. So the Ramchal thinks that's a way to bring you somewhat down. Then he says the following. Wisdom. And this is one of the biggest issues for people. People who are very intellectual. People who have very high IQs. Like some of you. 
The problem could be that you get conceited and haughty. Do you know how clever I am? Have, you, you actually don't really deserve to be speaking to me right now, truth be told, because and people think that. You know, when I used to go and go on university tours, my hardest tours were the cleverest universities. The Ivy League universities, where there was this almost uh, feeling, there was this energy in the air of, unless you don't have, unless you have a PhD, don't even bother speaking. And I've got news for you, everybody. I don't have a PhD. I decided to go and learn yeshiva. So I just wanted to learn Torah. So I don't have a PhD. You know, uh, I'm trying to think of the pay hey dalit. You know, I've got Purim and uh, I can't think of it now. I, I think about, I'm sure I've got a spiritual PhD. I maybe I don't have a actual PhD. And therefore, you know, maybe ban me, cancel me from my university tours because I don't have a PhD. Or maybe you don't need a PhD to go and speak in a university. Maybe you don't. Maybe like as long as you can talk and you've got something to offer, that could be cool. What I'm trying to get at is in certain universities, they have this level of, unfortunately, real arrogance, but they wouldn't even listen. They had like this, I'm not even listening, la, 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 la. I'm not listening. You don't have a PhD. You're not a professor. So come back when you've got a PhD and maybe we'll have a conversation. So, and yet in a certain period of us, in Ethics of Our Fathers, in chapter three, Ezu Chochem, who is a wise person? Halay made me call Adam. Jewish spirituality says the opposite. We don't, wisdom isn't if you have a PhD. Wisdom is something where you learn from every single person. I have dear friends from a spiritual perspective, a Kabbalistic perspective, every single human being in this world has something to offer. It's something that you can learn from. It's something that you should learn from. That's the difference between what we call Olam Emes and Olam Sheket, the world of truth and the world of lies. And the world of lies. Out there in society, too often portrays this world of lies where you need the PhD to be listened to. Mapi Tom, who says? Doesn't say in the Torah. It's a mitzvah to have a PhD and only those with PhDs can share Torah. Doesn't say that. I haven't found that possible. So, it's a huge problem with people who are very, very intelligent. And the Ramchal writes, someone who's intelligent can bring you to being conceited, haughtiness, because it derives from a noble quality. There is nothing, there is no such thing as a wise person who does not err, who doesn't need to learn from his peers. And by the way, we say in Perfect Obvious again, we call Lambda Iskalti. The teacher learns most from his students. So actually, I don't, we're not meant to learn most from your professors. You're meant to actually learn from anyone and everyone. And, and we're told we like, you know, we can learn from the, 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 the rabbi learns tremendous amount from his students, the most from his students. Therefore, what right does one have to be conceited concerning the wisdom that he possesses? But with a clear mind, a person, no matter how wise and distinguished he truly is, will realize as he observes and contemplates, there's no room for haughtiness. Think about it. A person with a high IQ, what did he do to deserve that? Like, did he like, go to IQ school and say, I'm really going to work hard to gain a very high IQ. I've got news. There's no such thing called an IQ school. You're born with it or not. Deal with it. And therefore, he says, for me, one of the most amazing lines I've ever heard any Torah scholar say, listen to this. He says, a person who is intelligent by nature, who naturally knows more than others, acts in accordance with his natural instincts, like a bird flying upwards since that is part of his nature. My friends, have you ever, any of you seen a bird which stops in the middle of its flying and says, I am so amazing. Look at me, I can fly and you can't, you lowly people. I'm so much better than you. I deserve a huge round of applause, everybody, for the fact that I can fly. Respect me for my flight. No bird says that unless he's Superman, right? No bird says that. Why? Because that's what you're born to do. No fish says, look at me, everybody. I can swim underwater. I'm the best underwater swimmer. I could be in the Olympics because that's what they're born to do. So I've got news for you. I've got news for you. Someone who's super intelligent, Hashem, give them that blessing. So what are you being conceited about? It's your blessing. It's just like a bird that flies. An ox, he then says, um, an ox who instinctively pulls with all of its strength 
The ox doesn't say, I deserve an Olympic gold medal because I, the ox, can lift things that no weightlifter can lift. No, because at the end of the day, the ox was born that way, which by the way, just shows how, sorry to say, maybe it's not that PC, how messed up the Olympian movement is. To say, just because you can jump further, climb higher, kick people into submission, doesn't mean like you are the hero of mankind. Uh, no, like, sorry to say, probably like what's the difference in you and many of the animals on this kingdom? which again need, needs to be loved and appreciated, but you're not doing anything greater. You know, for me, people who do great things, it says in Turkey, obviously again, Ezu Gibar, who is a strong man, come on Svi, how does it finish? You know, someone, someone put, put in, who is a strong man? This isn't Turkey, someone who subdues his inclination, someone who overcomes his lower inclination. If you beat your Yitzhara, then you need to clap. Anyone who's beating the Yitzhara today, I will give you a clap. Absolutely. Well done. That you deserve because that was your area of free will. If you're just utilizing the strength that God has given you, big deal. I should hope so. Otherwise, why has Hashem given it to you? He hasn't given it to you not to use. He's given it to use. So anyone, I even say singers, like people with the most amazing voices. Trust me, most people aren't blessed with that voice. Otherwise, we'd all be singing it, right? Having a beautiful voice. Yes, you're going to say to me, whoa, Rabbi Hill, you're being very unfair. The singer has to work so hard, and train so hard, and the Olympians, you know, out, you know, 20 hours a day, they're training, and blah, 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 blah. I know that. I get it. But ironically, I don't believe people want appreciation for their hard work. They want appreciation for their skill. And what we're saying, the skill didn't come from you. Mm -mm. you know you're not you don't become a great artist you're born artistic you're born musical you're born wise you're born with the ability to be an athlete yes of course people have to work and yes maybe there's certain exceptions when there's hard work but i would even argue let's say in the paralympics right when people have lost their limbs and yet are then still fighting through and doing amazing things i would still say that there's something strong spirit is coming from a higher place as well i've got news for you my friends without god's help we're not without god's help we drop dead and die within the moment that hashem wanted us to we're nothing without god sorry for being a bit maybe uh spiritual about it that's how we see things we're nothing without god and therefore what the heck are we trying to to take all god's credit for it's nothing to do with us it's our job is to be subservient our job is to thank hashem have gratitude to God. And by the way, absolutely show gratitude to others as well, but not to crave gratitude for oneself. If one wants to crave gratitude for oneself, then you're trespassing on God's space. And that's a lack of humility. And therefore he says, similarly, a person of high intelligence is that way by nature. And if another person who's not as intelligent as he had his intelligence, he would be clever. So think about it this very clever professor who's looking down at this person who's not a professor, if Hashem swapped their brains, then one would be the professor and one would be the not so intelligent person. Why are you looking down at them? Nothing to look down. You just, we just are as Hashem made us. Therefore, there's no reason for conceit and haughtiness. Rather, one who is very wise has a responsibility to impart his wisdom. And as it says, and this is classic again from Turkey others, if in the mother of Torah Harbeck. So let's say some of you are feeling you've been joining our Rabbi Hill talks on Sunday nights for years now, and now the Tuesday nights as well, and you're gaining tremendous knowledge, and you've subscribed to the YouTube channel, J Networks Fun Free, which if you haven't, please do now. And you feel you just this huge encyclopedia of knowledge. I've got news for you. The Mishnah says, if you learn a lot of Torah, don't take credit for yourself, because that's why I should have made you. Why do you think you were born? You were born on this planet to learn, to gain wisdom, and then to impart the wisdom. So what are you getting a big head about it for? So we've got, we've got Speed there, he's looking very tired. I hope I'm not boring you, right? He's, he's looking very tired on Zoom. He's probably been learning Torah all day. So his Yetzirah will say, oh, Speed, I've learned a lot of Torah tonight. Even in my relaxation moments, 
I'm learning the Silas Yisharim. Says the Mishnah to you, Tzvi, mm-mm, don't take the credit. That's what, why do you think you're alive and breathing? You're alive and breathing on this planet to do good, to learn Torah, to give charity, to do acts of kindness. That's why we're here. So don't start feeling, oh, I deserve a medal. We're in this culture of I deserve a medal culture. Why haven't I got a medal or a title? Or the only medal you should want is the medal Hashem is going to put around your neck in the world to come. And the kiss that Hashem will give you and the hug that Hashem will give you and say, I'm so proud of your achievements, of how you fought the world of illusion and how you overcame your lower self and how you did awesome things. Let's wait for them. Don't eat it now. You don't want it now. Because ironically, you start craving it now, that's lessons what Hashem can give you in the next world. Because you've kind of taken some of that appreciation right now. So be very reserved in your needs for immediate gratification and immediate congratulations and, and leave for when Hashem wants to give it to you in the next world. Let's go a little bit deeper. Rabbi Twersky. So Rabbi Twersky says something beautiful. He says something beautiful. Yeah. Let's give you a few stories, everybody. What's in the next world? Can't, go to my J Network talk of, of the world to come. But essentially, as soon as we get there, Katie, Hashem is going to give you all your rewards and all your congratulations and all your medals. And then you'll see what achievements actually you did, which, by the way, probably aren't the ones you think it is, ironically, because it's, it's, it's a surprise. There's lots of surprises there. It could be those subtle things that you didn't even realize was an amazing act. That's what was the amazing act. And Hashem will then give you your medals. And Hashem will give you what's called the Olam Haskar, the world of rewards. And that's where you get your medals and your rewards. We're not meant to get it now. We don't, shouldn't want to get it now. We should almost be embarrassed if we get it now. Because here we're here to work. It's like a, it's like a soldier in the middle of battle. In the middle of battle, doesn't want lieutenant in the middle of battle saying, let me give you a big reward and come over. Someone's going to get killed, God forbid. Someone's going to get shot. Someone's going to, you know, lose their right eye, God forbid. If you, Because right now we're in the middle of battle, my friends. We have until our last dying breath to make a difference to this world, to make a huge impact on this world. Who's got time to stop and have a ceremony to start saying, well done, Fitzfi, and well done, Baberda, you know? Would you like me to do like Oscars for those who are like most frequent visitors to our channel? I hope you don't want that. And maybe your Yetzirah wants it, but you shouldn't want to waste your time with that. Let's just get on with doing. So much more to learn. Please God, we're going to finish this book, and then we'll be on to the next book, and then on to the next book, and then on to the next book. We should have this drive to learn so much. We shouldn't need to step back and look for the reward ceremony. So he says a really cool story. There was a great time with this from Shlom and Luria. Lived above a vegetable store, whose proprietor was a God-fearing man. Seemed to be sincere, but very unlearned. Rabbi Luria once awoke in the middle of the night and heard someone studying Talmud with this beautiful med- melody. Curious, he followed the sound. He found that the proprietor studying Talmud in the wee hours of the morning was actually a very accomplished scholar. And this happened many times in very in Talmudic times where very great mystics, probably even now, because every generation, you have 36 hidden Sadiqim. So sometimes it could be the milkman. There was a milkman in Israel, and he was one of the 36. He was called the Chalban. He was a milkman, but actually he was a, an amazing Kabbalist. He knew it all, but hid it. Hid it. And only right at the end of his death, the pe- end of his life, people started realizing the Chalban. He was really a big Sadiq. So this was a story by Twersky saying Rabbi Luria found that the guy owning the vegetable store was really incredible, great mystic. So Rabbi Luria confronted him about this. And the man said to them, please, I'm sorry you found out. Don't let anyone know. I want to be anonymous. I don't want anyone to know. Shortly before Rabbi Luria's death, he called the community leaders and said, the person taking over me is the guy who owns the shop of vegetables. He's your next rabbi. He's really a Kabbalist in disguise. Different world, my friends, to the world we're living in nowadays. That everyone wants kudos and everyone wants celebration. Real greatness, they want to hide it. They want to keep it shtum. They want to keep it under undercover. Next story of Shlomo Sharabi, the renowned scholar and Kabbalist, came to Jerusalem from Yemen. And he took a job as a caretaker of a shul. Again, he wanted to be anonymous. This is classic amongst many mystics. 
they try and be totally anonymous. So he, he was going to be a caretaker. And he concealed his enormous erudition. When Torah classes were held, he liked to sit quietly saying Psalms. He couldn't help overhearing sometimes the Talmud discussion. So once the scholars, including their instructor, were stumped by a difficult problem in the Talmud, they were unable to resolve. Later that night, when everyone had left, this the caretaker, who now we know is Rabbi Sharabi, while he's putting the books away, he couldn't help himself. He wrote a brief note explaining the solution to the thorny problem and inserted it in the rabbi's book. This occurred several times. And eventually the instructor's daughter, the rabbi's daughter, curious and anxious to get to the root of the mystery, started keeping a close watch on the shawl. And one day noticed it was the caretaker who occasionally slipped a note into her father's book. Only that's when this rabbi Sharabi he was outed. So that's really the job to out the greats, to out the mystics. The real great mystics you don't even know who they are. The, the neighbor might not even realize. And I used to love that when I used to live in Israel. There was a time I lived in Mer Sharim, my first yeshiva I went to, Terrace Motion. It was awesome. Sometimes I was like walking around the street and I could see like at two in the morning a little light by one of the windows. And just they're just learning through the night, anonymous, hidden scholars. And I just felt, wow, I was in a place of such holiness, such holiness. The Chofetz Chaim, great Chofetz Chaim, once often had students new to his yeshiva sleep in his house until they were able to arrange for regular logics. Once a student <coughs> reported that one night he awoke and heard the great sage crying, Yisrael Meir, do you deserve the honors being given to you? Have you even fulfilled even 100 of what a Jew is supposed to do? Why do you deserve honor? You're just a simple person. Meaning the great Chovetz Chaim, probably the number one of the generation, past 200 years, used to be so embarrassed that people used to give him respect. He was so embarrassed that people were like making a big deal of him. And he used to cry and say, oh, if only they would know what I know. They wouldn't be giving me any respect. My friends, that's the way to do it. Now people cry that they don't get respect. <laughs> You know, they should have respected me. You know, why wasn't I given credit? It's the opposite. It should be the opposite. You cry when you are given credit. Now, again, just to be very clear, very important point. There's a balance to play, my friends, in life. If you're feeling a bit down, feeling a bit of low self-esteem, then sometimes you do need to pick yourself up. We're going to learn about that soon. And there's a verse. You're meant to have these two verses, and you're meant to write them out. And in your right pocket is one verse. In your left pocket is in the other verse. On your right pocket, put in, write down the words, for my sake, the world was created. The reason why Hashem only made Adam and Eve as an hermaphrodite wasn't initially male and female. When Hashem made the animals, it was male and female, male and female. Humanity was initially made as one to teach you that the whole world was based just for you because Hashem didn't make the world for the lion people. He didn't make the world for the dogs and the cats. Hashem made the world for homo sapiens, the spiritual human beings who are here to enact free will. So initially there was only one of us. So in a sense, the whole world is just for you, Verda. And for you to be, the whole world is just for one. And when you're feeling a bit low, just realize you can change the world. And really the whole of mankind was made for you, just to give you a pick up. If you're ever feeling conceited and arrogant, and psh, I deserve more respect, then bring yourself down with the, letter you're meant to put in the left pocket, which is, I'm like dust and ashes. I'm nothing. You know, at the end of the day, when I leave this world, I'm going to go back to the dust. I came from the dust. Adam comes from the word Adama, the ground, the earth. We go back to the dust afterwards. The maggots eat us. You know, we're not that. We're not all that. So, so we need to create this balance to keep you in this equilibrium of healthy self-esteem, but in a place of humility in a place of humility. One last story, he says from Rabbi Tversky, says the Hasidic master, Rabbi Chaim of Chironovitz asked, Torah says that Moses was the most humble man of all. He says, right, the Torah says he was the most humble man of all. How could this be? Was Moses not aware? How could Moses have, and Moshe Rabbeinu had to write that? Moshe had greater aspects of prophecy than no one else. How can Moshe Rabbeinu have written? He was the most humble man of all. He's the only one to speak directly to Hashem face to face. 
The Chaim answers that Moshe reason that his great capacities came about because he was taken up to heaven after the Torah was given in the company of angels who had afforded intimate contact with other people would have had that. They could have also achieved that and maybe done even greater things. Meaning Moshe Rabbeinu didn't take, didn't take credit for himself. Any spiritual gift that he was achieving, it wasn't because I earned it. This was my hard work. He understood everything was a blessing. And that, my friends, is the way to do it. Are you listening? You have tremendous talents God has given you. And you're meant to say, wow, such a blessing. I've got those talents. Let me see how hard I can work to make the world a better place by using my talents. But at no point say, I deserve credits and recognition and pats on the back for that. Because then you don't realize that it's not you. Because essentially, this is the point. You are not the cause of your talents. You are not the cause of your blessings. You are the medium that Hashem works through. And that's why, my friends, on one hand, you like Moses, he knew exactly who he was. He knew how much he knew who's the only one on the planet who's ever and will ever speak to God face to face. But he was so humble about it because he was nothing to do with him. He's like, okay, that's what Hashem wants me to do. C'est la vie. I don't think he said c'est la vie. He probably thought c'est la vie. Let me finish by connecting it now to this week's Pasha. This week's Pasha, what, what, what Cedric did we just read? Anyone like to, to chat in? What was the week's Pasha we just had? It's called Titzave. Titzave. It was actually, ironically, the only Pasha in the whole Bible since Moses' birth where his name isn't mentioned, such as his humility. So let me share with you a few things from Rabbi Biederman about humility in this week's parsha. So point number one, he asked the question. As the Gemara in Eirikin, page 16, page 16 says the following. Why do the sacrifices follow the discussion of the clothes of the Kohanim? It's an amazing thing. If any of you into fashion, last week, etc., it's all about clothes wear. It's all about clothes. It's really interesting. Which, by the way, it's a very deep Kabbalistic idea. What is clothes? They're meant to hide the, the soul, exactly what clothes are. Clothes are a good thing, bad thing. It's not for now. But the Talmud says, why do we have sacrifices followed by clothes? Answers the Talmud. This is to tell you that just as the sacrifices atone, so the clothes of the priests atoned. And they had a special hat that the Kohanim used to wear. Anyone know the name of the hat? It wasn't a Borsalino. Anyone know the name of the hat? Like to type in? What's the name of the hat? This is in last week's section. The priests would wear it's called the mitznefes. The mitznefes. The mitznefes. A big hat. And apparently that hat atoned for arrogance. And the question is, that's really bizarre. Like, why wear it? Like, nice big posh hat. If you go, maybe James can put it on, um, on your link and have a look actually what the hat looked like. If you go and like, what does the mitznefes of the Cohen look like? You can see it was like a very big, almost ostentatious and almost arrogant looking hat. So how on earth, by wearing a nice hat, so by the way, it's really interesting, when you're wearing nice clothes, the Yetzirah wants you to say, Psh, look at me, I'm the man, I'm the woman, right? I want my photo and get my selfie stick and let's put it on my Instagram and everyone can see like I'm wearing my new fashion label, blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, yeah, that's not how to be, right? So, so that's, so why are we saying that the Kohen had this amazing hat and that's all in humility? Why is that? Flesh is lemish on Instagram, smashing you with Mitznefes, yeah. So here's my, we got an answer to that. Why did the Mitznefes teach humility? If anything, it maybe could have led to arrogance. Shh, look at me, look how cool I look. I'm the Kohen. The other geezers can't wear that Mitznefes. It's all about me. Oh. So the Maharsha in Zvokim, 88 answers and says the following. There's two answers. This is going to be answer number one. One of the reasons why I wear a kippah, there's a few reasons why we, we, the men have head coverings. One of the reasons why we taught the men to have head coverings is because it brings humility. Why? Because Gemara Shabbat, page 156, there's a story that astrologers said to the mother of Nachman that her son one day will be a thief. To prevent this, she was cautious to have her son's head always covered. She would say to him, cover your head so you'll fear Hashem and you dove in the Yitzhah shouldn't rule over you. When I have this head covering, and it's really interesting, 
it just gives me the sense of there's someone above me. It gives me the sense of awesomeness of God, fear of God. It just grounds me. And, and if it's not on, it feels a bit weird, to be quite honest. If it's not, I was like, where's my cup? Where's my cup? You know, some people have a sleeping cup, but even when they sleep, they have this big couple that stays on them when they sleep to keep us modest, even when we sleep. There was a story once, this guy was studying under a date tree and this couple fell off his head. He saw the dates and, the over, and his Yitzhara overcame him. The moment the couple goes off, he climbed the tree and bit into the date. Meaning straight away, he, he lost his self-control the moment that the, the couple came off, the moment the head covering came off. So the first answer is this head covering of the Kohen, just he understood it was a direction and a focus that Hashem's over you. Hashem's so over you. So if you know, in Kabbalah, we say that when you're praying, you actually need to have two head coverings. One isn't enough. That's why, when, that's why we wear a hat. That's why you'll see a lot of rabbis wear hats when it comes to prayer, because you, you've got to really focus in on the humility and focus in on the reverence of God. That's why we put the talit over our heads when you're praying. That sort of A, retains the aura Kabbalistically, but it also grounds you. That's one answer. But now there's another answer which goes even more deeper. Okay, listen to this. It's a bit of a counterintuitive answer, so stay with me. It's a little bit complicated. It says the following. The mitznefes looks like a symbol of pride. If you had like a really posh hat, I've actually seen right now a lot of the, the pop stars, they're wearing these big hats now, right? These like cool cowboy hats and these huge big hats. That's like the cool thing to do. They're now copying the rabbis. See, at the end of the day, you know, we were into hats way before the pop stars were. So they're finally f following our fashion, right? Funny, it's a true story. I was literally walking down the road a few weeks ago wearing my like Italian rabbi hat. And like, I was just stopped. That's an amazing hat. Can you tell me where I can buy that from? If I like, you know, you're, you're, you're my, just like my friendly non-Jewish guy walking down the road. He loved my hat. I don't think he was taking the make. I think he really genuinely wanted it, which is really interesting because hats can be cool. But we're saying on one hand, it's a symbol of pride and that's going to atone the arrogance. Why? Here we go. This is really counterintuitive. My friends, one of the ways for you to embrace humility is to be almost arrogant in the service of God. Now, what does that mean? Now, again, you need to understand every trait, there's, there's a way to use that trait for good. There's a very important verse, which maybe James can put on the link. It's from Divrei Hayamim 2, chapter 17, verse 6. I want you to inscribe. If anyone wants to get another tattoo, put this tattoo on you. Actually, don't. But I'm, I'm being a joke, right? But you should inscribe this very important verse somewhere in your iPhone, in your journal. And this is the verse. His heart was elevated in the ways of Hashem. His heart was arrogant in the ways of Hashem. We should be so full of pride, what we call Jewish pride. You know, I think I told you this before. One of my biggest issues is in too many culturally Jewish papers, it's all about anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism. This person doesn't hate this. They hate us and they hate us and they hate us and they used to hate us and they still hate us and they will hate us. Everyone's talking about how much people hate and anti-Semitism. I want to ban all that. Let's talk about pro-Semitism. Let's talk about there's so much we should be proud of. There's so much Am Yisrael Chai. There's so many beautiful things that God has given the Jewish people to achieve in this world. Let's focus on our blessings. And the, let's be so proud to be Jewish. By Yigba, Liba, Ibedar Hashem. You don't have to be like meek, embarrassed. Like, no, 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 I'm not Jewish. Be Jewish? No. I just have chicken soup all day and bagels, but I'm not Jewish, right? We, 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 shouldn't, we shouldn't be embarrassed to be Jews. We should be proud. You know, too many people like, they don't want to wear the milk and it out. They don't want to have their kippah on. They don't want to have their sits out. Bring it on. Be proud. It's such a schut, such a merit. It's such a merit to feel like a Jew, to act like a Jew, to dress like a Jew. And how does that bring humility? Because when you utilize, this is the point, when you utilize that level of arrogance in the service of God, 
then the arrogance gets all used up and is used for the for Hashem, and therefore there's no arrogance left for the ego. Understand this. There's this battle 24-7 between your ego and your soul, between the Yitzhatov, which is your soul, the inclination for your the, the good inclination, and the Yitzhahorah, which one of my students said, the Yitzhahorah, the horror Yitzhah, right? The, the, the inclination of horror, right? So you've got this, the devil on your shoulder and the angel on your shoulder, and they're both fighting over arrogance. And the question is, who's going to be drinking from the fountain of arrogance? So let the soul drink from it. How does the soul drink from it? I've got such pride to serve you, God. I've got such pride to be sharing Torah with you, to learn Torah. Wow, this holy book of the Ramchal. Mwah. I've got it. I'm so excited and so infused and so proud to learn it. So what then? The ego can't access the pride because it's all used up and can't be proud for my glasses, which I was not proud of, or can't be proud for my shirt, or can't be proud for my amazing hairstyle. Because at the end of the day, there's no proud, there's no pride left. You've used the pride for Hashem, for mitzvahs, for Torah, for goodness. So then your lower self can't access the pride. So the mystics explained, you know why? The Kohen would wear the mitznefes, would wear the hat, because they would, the soul, and they would be attached to the pride of being a priest. But there was no scope for their lower self then to utilize and drink from the fountain of pride for negativity. You're always going to feel pride, but are you going to use it for negativity or positivity? This verse, let's just say it one last time, because it's awesome, which is Vayigva Hashem. You should be proud in the service of Hashem. That's how we should access pride. And I'll just finish off before I finish with one last story. Really amazing story of Robert Biederman says, he said like this, there was, and I've heard many stories similar to this. So see if you enjoy it. Nice to see you in my mind, Gary from Berlin. I think he's on Insta. What's up, man? Send me a message. So he says like this, there's a base of metrics in Lakewood, says Robert Biederman in America. It was built due to the fundraising efforts of one businessman there. And he felt, he built up the synagogue and he felt like a sense of responsibility. And he felt he could shape a lot of the direction of the synagogue and this businessman, he really didn't like. To be honest, I share his passion. He didn't like speaking in synagogue. It's not a good thing. By the way, if you go to synagogue, speak so much to God, but not to anyone else, right? Speak to, speak to your friends outside the synagogue. If you're in the place of synagogue, just focus on you and Hashem. And he felt the same. And he used to sometimes like bang on the bimmer. No speaking in my show. No one speaking in the show. In the show, when the safer car is out, no speaking. And he used to do that every week. And then one day, a guy with a bigger voice than him said, well, I'm just because you have a loud voice doesn't give you the right to start telling us what to do. I've got a louder voice. Chill out. Don't be so holy. I've seen you speak as well. And the businessman who founded the show was so embarrassed. God, because to be like shouted back after he's asking people not to, to speak in show, he got so embarrassed. First of all, he went to this man in the synagogue who had been married for seven years and never had children and said, I just endured a lot of humiliation. So I give you a blessing that in merit of my humiliation I just had, you should have kids. But he couldn't face going back to that synagogue again. He was too embarrassed that synagogue that he built up, he was almost, they was, everyone was laughing at him, and mocking him. And the businessman felt, I'm out. One day, this, the man he gave the blessing to, who still hadn't had a child, it was the third of ER, and it was the yacht site of a very, very big tzaddik, which I really recommend that you go to his grave on that tzaddik. He's called Rav Shaila. Living, he's buried in Hungary. Anyone is living anywhere near Hungary, I really recommend. It's a very powerful grave to go to and pray there. And he said, I want to go and pray for my child to have children there. I need you to do me a favor. If you go and make up with that synagogue and embarrass yourself by going in and just making up with them, just make it up. Just, just, just be friends again. I just want to see friendship. And I know it's going to be a little bit embarrassing, but if you can overcome that ego and overcome that hurt and just make friends, I really believe with that, 
And then me going to the grave, I'm going to be able to have children. Can you do that for me? And the businessman like said, I wasn't expecting that. That's a bit hard thought. That's a bit harsh. But I obviously, I want you to have kids. And he did that. He went back to the synagogue. He made up. His friend went to Keristir to pray by the grave of the tzaddik. And a year later, after 18 years, he had a baby. He had a baby in merit of the humility that someone got through being embarrassed and then, and then overcoming the ego once again and making friendship, a miracle happened. A miracle happened. So that's why I'd like to conclude. Miracles can happen to our lives if we can embrace humility. I will give you a blessing right now that Hashem should help you embrace humility. Be proud in the service of Hashem. And therefore there's no space for pride to be used from the ego. And Hashem should therefore shower tremendous blessings on each and every one of us.